Hi, everyone. Okay, thanks, Eric. Um, well, you probably don't want to be the winner of the complication competition, but I guess we've all been there, so uh, I want to show you this case, um, which is actually back from my uh, interventional fellowship days here at Sick Kids, and um, a few of my deep thoughts about it, and I'm sure I'll hear your thoughts too. <laughs> uh, this is a full-term baby girl, uh, 2.8 kilograms. She was born with an antenatal diagnosis of transposition. Her fetal echo already showed that the interatrial septum was somewhat aneurysmal, but it looked like the ASD was going to be big. The postnatal echo, however, showed that it was a relatively small ASD. Okay. Oh, it works. Great. Uh, just a couple of echo images. It's a simple transposition, intact ventricular septum. And the atrial septum, I guess in seek is, um, was a bit redundant, aneurysmal, and uh, there was this small, relatively small ASD here, superiorly was measuring about two millimeters, two and a half. There was, there was uh, some good flow through that ASD. It wasn't actually restrictive or maybe just the angle we couldn't appreciate it. And the, the child actually came in. She was hemodynamically stable. Um, she looked very well. Her preductal oxygen saturation was 76 to 84. On, uh, she was already on prostate when she arrived. And um, this is the point where um, you think, well, would you do the septostomy on a completely stable child? Just a quick show of hands. How many of you would do a septostomy on this uh, stable child with an ASD? OK, good. <laughs> There's a couple here. Well, at Sick Kids, we usually would do a septostomy on all the kids who have uh, an ASD that looked relatively small and that had uh, that could lead to restriction. So we uh, got set up for a bedside septostomy. The baby was intubated and uh, got access. There were issues with the balloons uh, from the get-go, actually, probably because of this septum. So the first balloon, uh, when I inflated it, couldn't really see where it went, so took it out and replaced it and got a brand new balloon, started over, did one successful pull, but then the second time uh, the balloon just wouldn't come. And um, this is where I stopped and said, okay, the balloon's not coming, but my colleagues, I think, thought that I wasn't being um, vigorous enough. <laughs> And uh, then the balloon broke off the shaft, and we saw it in the right ventricle on the echo, and then in the transverse arch. Actually, Matt was telling this story uh, yesterday, and I thought, uh, wow, this, I didn't really think this happened many times. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, yeah. It's never never good to be part of that series. So uh, we had a bit of a discussion. The surgeon wasn't keen on taking this few hour old baby to do a switch already. So we decided to take her to the cath lab to try to retrieve the balloon. And if that was, would fail, she would go for surgical retrieval. Um, this is our first image from the cath case. Uh, it wasn't no longer in the transverse arch. We found it down in the abdominal aorta and inserted the forefront pigtail in the artery to control uh, how far this balloon was going to go. And uh, then we got a long, a seven French sheath in the vein through the RV to the arterial duct and to the um, proximal aorta. And um, what we saw when we injected contrast was that yes, the balloon is still quite big and inflated. And, um, but the contrast was flowing around it distally and there was good perfusion distally. So um, we had, a, at least we thought a bit of time to try and catch it. And of course, then we start trying to, uh, to catch the balloon. The, the snaring part wasn't so hard, and we were able to snare it several times at different locations, but the issue was mainly the angle. As you can imagine, one, the angle of how the sheath was uh, versus the balloon made it very, very hard to uh, bring the balloon safely and fully into the sheath. And the second thing was that part of the shaft was already also still attached to this, which made it very, very hard to uh, bring it into the sheath. Um, I'm not sure uh, I don't, if we actually cut the long sheath at an angle to try and uh, improve our chances of, of getting this balloon into the long sheath, but I do remember trying quite a few times and it just made nice, nice okay. images. Okay. So this is 
So I think it was the Edwards balloon, the seven French. This is? Yeah. You don't, you don't, I think it's it not, the, it doesn't look yeah, like it's the new med. That's, that's, like that's, a new, that's, that's not, that's not a. Yeah. Um, not okay. Because where the marker is. It looks like it's the new med balloon. Yes, so the six French. Yes, absolutely. Yes, well, that's it's true. Happen. It's not going to happen. And also the snare, I mean, it's just, if you snare both ends, you might be able to. So here, uh, we did do that too. Because the balloon material, yeah. Well, we tried to collapse it more. Yeah, but yeah. the balloon material is not collapsible because there's no negative inside the balloon. You can stretch the catheter. Yeah. But the balloon is, you see what comes out when, you, when it's intact. It's all folded. Yeah, I was. I was. Now I want to hear. No experience. No experience. Very good. Yeah, I was going to say if you'd had any experience in actually been able to retrieve it ever, because I wonder if anybody had, if this was a futile attempt. In any case, uh, we tried to snare the other side as well and to control. And this is. Um, I think this is one of the la was one of our last pictures when uh, there was finally a decision that we'd time our, our time was up, and this baby went to the uh, to the operating room and uh, had retrieval of this balloon via thoracotomy. Actually, she um, then had quite a complicated post-op course. Uh, m multiple systems were affected, and she finally had her arterial switch at six weeks of life. But um, made a pretty good recovery from that. A few weeks later, went home, breathing spontaneously, eating, feeding well, and started growing and making up for what we'd done. So uh, this taught me quite a few things. Of course, the, the force thing, which I think I knew before. Um, I definitely, it makes me think before every septostomy, what do I need to plan for this case? Is this a case that I can't do bedside? Is this a case that I require special equipment for? Is the child even stable enough for me to do this? And um, certainly has made me think about the septostomies, and um, I, I tend to only do them when I think they're clinically indicated, even if the ASD is quite small, if the child feels well, and I don't have an anatomical issue, like I need to rule out a coarctation or something, by turning off the prostaglandin, I usually, well, certainly this told me that some of them are, <laughs> can, some things can happen. Okay, thank you. Thank you.